Okay, so welcome back to Existential Psychology here at the University of West Georgia. This video will be the very first video where we'll be taking a look at the 20th century existential philosopher Martin Heidegger. So we're going to be uh, moving east geographically speaking because we just got done a series of eight videos on Jean-Paul Sartre. So we're going to be moving east several hundred miles into Germany. So uh, if you look at Martin Heidegger's life dates, he was roughly speaking a contemporary of Sartre. Uh, but the first thing to notice, perhaps, is that his most famous seminal work, Being and Time, Sein und Zeit in German, uh, was published 16 years before Being and Nothingness. So in a way, although they were contemporaries, uh, Heidegger's big work came somewhat before Sartre's big work. So. Heidegger's project. Let's uh, outline Heidegger's project. I'm going to do this uh, relatively quickly. Go through the first few pages of your notes relatively quickly. The reason why is because a lot of these ideas you've already encountered earlier this semester, so I don't think I need to sort of, uh, you know, uh, go on about them in, de in detail. But let's uh, at least provide you with a rough outline of Heidegger's project. So. Uh, Heidegger's project, one of the first obvious differences uh, between Heidegger's project and Sartre's is that in being in nothingness, probably the cent most central construct in being in nothingness is consciousness, where as in being and time, uh, the most central construct is going to be being itself. Okay, so Heidegger is all about being. Uh, the entirety of being in time is full of talk about doing a kind of uh, phenomenological analytic of Dasein, which is a fancy way of saying phenomenological inquiry into the structure of being. His later works also retained the emphasis on being, and so definitely for Heidegger, the big question is what is the structure or meaning or significance of being? As such, he's interested in the project of doing what he calls fundamental ontology. Ontology, of course, you'll recall, is the philosophical study of the nature of being. But he wants to do it in the most fundamental way possible, uh, which means that he doesn't want to fall into what Edmund Husserl, his teacher, called a regional ontology. So a regional ontology would be something like asking about the question of being from the perspective of a specific discipline. For instance, you can ask about the question of being with regard to the project of psychology, or ask about the question of being within the purview of the discipline of sociology, or anthropology, or any other discipline. He doesn't want to inadvertently slip into doing a kind of regional ontology. Instead, he wants to ask the question of being in the most fundamental way possible. Now, for Heidegger, what that would mean is uh, asking about the question of being in a phenomenological way. And he makes the claim early on in Being in Time, in one of the two introductions to the work, okay, so two introductions, that that kind of inquiry into the nature of being hasn't been done since the time of the pre-Socratics. Okay, dramatic pause here. So Heidegger's early contention in Being in Time is that this entire project of inquiring into the nature of being hasn't really been done uh, for thousands of years, and moreover, all of the mass of philosophical insights, and not just philosophical insights, but the entire mass of industry, science, and technology that we've evolved since the time of classical Greek antiquity has been fundamentally ungrounded in, in any systematic, convincing inquiry into the nature of being. Now this is a pretty dramatic claim. And, uh, you know, but to make it seem a little bit more convincing to you and a little bit more palpable to you, uh, you know, consider, have you ever sort of wondered about uh, how often it is that the Western intellectual trajectory has given birth to all kinds of basically negative phenomena alongside the very positive phenomena that it has also given birth to? So I listed a couple out there, you know, that uh, 20th century, uh, oh my goodness, history of the 20th century. It's like genocide of the month club. There are so many of them. There are Mao, uh, Chairman Mao's uh, genocidal uh, movements 
Uh, there are Stalin's <laughs> infamous, infamous uh, starvation of the kulaks in the Ukraine. Uh, there's, of course, um, World War II with its uh, body counts in the tens of millions, uh, Pol Pot's genocidal exterminations, and so on. So have you ever sort of wondered about, like, well, how is it that this Western intellectual trajectory uh, seems to give birth to these uh, genocidal, highly destructive movements? Why is it that uh, we have, I guess, a, I would say, a, a dubious at best relation to the natural world in terms of, you know, the extermination of other species and despoilment of the natural environment and things like that? Well, uh, you know, Heidegger's insight is that the reason why all that kind of stuff happens is ultimately because we have become estranged from the reality of being and the main reason we've become estranged from it is because we've never seriously asked about it. We don't have any genuine understanding, which for him is a phenomenologically based understanding of what it is to be. So consequently, the mechanisms of industry and technology sort of are riding without anyone in the driver's seat, so to speak. Like there's no radical fundamental connection to any sort of comprehensive uh, understanding of being and consequently they just sort of go their own way producing these quasi-random highly injurious effects as we move on. Okay so uh, another thing that maybe we should note as we're setting up Heidegger's project to help you understand it before we get into the details which will start to happen in the next video not this one. This video is all about setting up his project and helping you understand it. So all the talk of hermeneutics that you heard earlier this semester um, is going to definitely figure within Heidegger's phenomenological project. So uh, one way of talking about it is he's, he's up to a uh, hermeneutic, a hermeneutic of Dasein in a sense. Dasein is going to be the German coinage uh, that refers to our being in the world. So a hermeneutic, let's remind you of what that is, although hopefully you remember it from Test 1 material. It's a systematic philosophical interpretation of something. Usually it's cast in terms of a circular type structure, although at the time, earlier this semester, I was arguing that maybe a helical geometric metaphor is actually more apt for what hermeneutics is doing, because a helix or a spring type geometry only looks circular from a certain perspective, but there's actually movement deflected across the depth axis or the z-axis if you're sort of versed in <laughs> mathematics a little bit. Okay, so uh, a hermeneutic. So he's going to be doing this hermeneutic of uh, everyday experience with an eye toward revealing its meaning with regard to the question of being. Okay, so uh, his way of glossing uh, that project is to let that which shows itself be seen from itself in the very way in which it shows itself from itself. And it's like, oh my goodness, what a bunch of gobbledygook. And uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, but uh, so let's gloss that in a little bit easier way. I did it in your notes. Let's see, well, how did I do it in your notes? Um, to let phenomena reveal themselves in a relatively straightforward way. Okay, so. Uh, that's his initial characterization of what phenomenology is doing, although he deepens it later in the book, in Being in Time. Now, uh, here's the deal about the gobbledygook element in Heidegger's writing. Uh, I'm not giving you a reading assignment <laughs> from Heidegger, uh, and the reason why is that at the undergraduate level, it tends to be too difficult for the vast majority of students, probably only... Uh, eight or ten percent of undergraduate students will be able to get through any appreciable mass of Heidegger, if that many. So uh, I've learned through experience not to assign reading assignments, except if you're an independent studies student or something like that, in reading Heidegger itself. Now if you're sort of a natural and sort of advanced or perhaps used to reading philosophy, you know, you might try to tackle uh, being in time, there are two translations in English, one by Macquarie and Robinson, which was published in 1962, and another more recent one published by Joan Stambaugh in 1996. I've read both of them. I tend to prefer the earlier Macquarie and Robinson one, but maybe that's just because I'm a little bit of a 
dinosaur, possibly. Anyhow, part of the reason why I like their translation is they, they, uh, they retain the original quotations in Greek rather than transliterated Greek. And since I studied Greek when I was a kid, you know how kids are always doing stuff like that, always studying ancient Greek and popping wheelies and trading baseball cards. Well, uh, I prefer to read the classical Greek in the original, and they retain the classical Greek passages in the original. So. Uh, but that may be just me. Maybe you'll like Joan Stambaugh if you want to try to tackle it. It's sort of like, um, mm, <laughs> be forewarned that it's difficult. In fact, uh, so much so that there's a kind of joke that has evolved out of um, uh, Heidegger's writings and uh, the sort of intimidating uh, seeming opacity of his writings and it goes like this. So we're going to have a little joke moment here in your first video. And the joke goes like this. You know, it's fundamentally impossible to translate Heidegger even into German. Okay, all right, so <laughs> give you a second there to laugh. Possibly, probably not. Usually the jokes I tell in class, no one laughs at. But So it's uh, fundamentally impossible to translate Heidegger even into German. Okay, so that might be a, a, uh, a caution sign for you along the road if you want to try to get a hold of being in time and see if you can dig into it. But at any rate, okay, so it's going to be this hermeneutic project. And basically it's going to be uh, moving in a circular or helical way. So uh, being in time as a book is divided into two parts or divisions as they're known technically. And the first one has to do with uh, that initial uh, hermeneutic arc with respect to the question of being. And then the second one is going to be doing another hermeneutic arc with respect to the question of time. So the title of the book, Being and Time in, in, way, in a Way, is already outlining uh, the project, or at least the project of that book. Actually, uh, Being in Time was, uh, he gives you an outline of the much larger project that he had in mind, of which Being in Time was the only part he got done, or the only two parts that he got done. All right, so it's going to be more or less doing this uh, uh, hermeneutic, circular, or helical type movement within the book. And uh, a, a way of thinking about that is is going to be oscillating between two levels of description, okay? So, uh, and hopefully this is gonna sound familiar to you because you've already heard this talk before in this class. So the first level of description, as you might well infer, given that I'm already beginning to speak the language of phenomenology and hermeneutics, would be uh, the level of everyday experience. In other words, uh, the level of how we experience life in a very everyday, immediate, pre-reflective sort of way. Okay, now the second level is going to have to do with the articulation of the meaning or significance or coherence of that. Now, there's a whole lot of vocabulary that runs throughout being in time uh, that is only roughly explained to you in the book. So to, to sort of sort that out with respect to this distinction between these two levels or layers of meaning, if you want to think about it that way, uh, is this. So in your notes, uh, I'm grouping in big bold letters the word ontic, the word, oh my goodness, that next one looks like a misprint, existential, ending in E-L-L, -L, which looks like just a weird coinage, and being with a small b, all of those are going to be on the side of describing everyday experience or things that happen at the level of everyday more or less pre-reflective experience. So that's the one level of this hermeneutic circle or arc. And the other one is going to have to do with words like ontological. So the ontic is everyday experience. Ontological means articulating the meaning of everyday experience. Existential, E-L-L, -L, is going to have to do with everyday experience. Existential, I-A-L at the end of the word is going to have to do with articulating the meaning or significance of that. Uh, the word being with a capital B is going to be on the order of 
the phenomenological articulation of the meaning of everyday experience. Okay, so once again, with a small b, it's going to be described saying something about our everyday experience. So uh, the way to sort of get a handle, an initial handle on the pretty confusing uh, language that you encounter pretty quickly in being in time is to sort of segment up those two provinces, uh, understand that there's going to be a circular activity occurring between those two levels or layers of interpretation and to match those vocabulary words. So on one side of the divide we have the words, let's say it again, because normally students need to hear things multiple times. Ontic existential with ELL, being small b. That's at the level of everyday experience. At the level of articulating the meaning or significance of everyday experience, we're going to have terms like ontological, existential, like the normal word existential ending in IAL, and then being Big B, big capital B, being on the other side. All right, so that's the an outline of the project. Now, one of the first um, insights that he comes to uh, within the purview of uh, letting that which shows itself be seen from itself in the very way in which it shows itself for uh, from itself, excuse me, is uh, the realization that uh, being is about Dasein. Okay, so. Sein in German is the infinitive form of the verb to be. All right, so Sein, like Sein und Zeit, the title of the book, being and time. All right, Sein means to be, and Da in German means there. Okay, so really when he's talking about this Dasein business, what he's talking about is being there in some sense. Okay, so being where? Well, the where is in the world. Okay. So the reason uh, why he's using this coinage, and we gloss it in English as being in the world hyphenated, and the trick behind that phrase is the hyphens. Like if you understand the hyphens, like being in the world, as though being and world are so integrally connected that we need one single word to describe it. Okay, And that one single word is denoted by the hyphens in the English phrase. So uh, the idea is that uh, there is no being apart from the world. There is no world apart from being that the two are knit together so tightly that really what we need to do is an analytic of being in the world or an analytic of Dasein in order to uh, fulfill this phenomenological hermeneutic project that he has in mind. Okay, so uh, and notice the contrast by the way. So uh, one of the uh, I guess nuclear realizations within his phenomenological project is the realization of Dasein or being in the world. Notice how different that is from the two or possibly three depending upon how you count them nuclear realizations in Sartre's phenomenological inquiry into the structure of being and consciousness. So uh, for Sartre there's the in itself or en soi in French and the for itself, or the pour soi in French, okay? So, uh, you know, Sartre's articulation has to do with the correspondence between the in itself and the for itself, uh, which more or less begins to sound much more dichotomous, in essence, than uh, Heidegger's talk about Dasein. And I think, to, personally, uh, I prefer Heidegger's ontology because it's much more faithful, I think, to, uh, the holistic uh, import, basically, of existential phenomenology. I like Sartre too, but not for that reason. I like how he exemplifies things and makes things accessible to the public. I love that about Sartre. Like he's willing to cast his insights in terms of plays like No Exit and novels like Nausea, and uh, you know, make and popularize things like the essay you read, The Humanism of Existentialism, was his attempt to make all of this. Uh, seemingly abstract, um, you know, daunting stuff more accessible to the public. Har Heidegger hardly ever does that at all. You know, Heidegger sort of ranges from hard to very hard to read, okay? So, like, Sartre can get very hard to read too, but he can get, I would say, easy to read, 
you know, so in my, in my little system of how difficult things are. Like, I would say that the humanism of existentialism is easy or maybe middling in terms of its difficulty, but Heidegger never gets easy or middling for sure. Now, part of the reason why Heidegger uh, feels inclined to use coinages which make his writing hard or very hard, coinages like Dasein, is that he has detected, I think rightly so, that part of the way we see being in a fairly dichotomous way in terms of subjects and objects, in other words, like the usual account of existence or being or reality or something like that, is that, well, you know, there are object-like things and then there are uh, subject, subjective-like things, which is a distinction we see reflected in Sartre's distinction between the in itself and the for itself. Uh, part of the reason why he feels like he, he needs to find weird linguistic ways of trying to get around that is that the distinction between subjects and objects in a way is woven into European language systems themselves. And here, let's since we're speaking in English, uh, let's uh, look at English. So when you study English, when you're a kid, they tell you that, well, you know, every English sentence has a subject and a predicate. And of course, a predicate or a subject, let's take the subject first, is a noun, and a predicate is a verb phrase, and then you can have different variations on predicates, like you can have um, objects of prepositions and direct objects and indirect objects, you know, when you study grammar and grammar school, <laughs> oddly enough. Uh, but kind of what you should be inferring is that sentences are composed of subjects and objects which are kept separate. They're inseparable um, grammatical categories, all right? So uh, the fix is in, in essence, the particular way of seeing reality is already woven into the language system we're, use, we're using to try to describe it. So the language system itself already prefigures a certain way of seeing reality. So what, because Heidegger is interested in doing something like a fundamental ontology, a fundamental inquiry into the nature of being, he doesn't want to slip into the trap of having the answer to the question, what is being, be preordained by the kind of separation between subjects and objects that is already coded into and woven into especially European language systems. All right, so uh, that and that may sound like an apologist argument, possibly. You know, well, you're just apologizing for, you know, Heidegger's abstrusity in essence in, in his writing. Well, you know, uh, whether you buy that or not, I guess is uh, perhaps a matter of taste. So, uh, because the nuclear realization is has to do with Dasein, okay, the unity of subject and object, the unity of being and world. All right, that that's the nuclear realization. Because of that, phenomenology itself is irreducibly situated in the world. Any attempt we have to understand things is irreducibly situated within the world we're trying to understand as part of that project. And here, maybe it sounds a little bit like that whole Sartrean business of existence preceding essence, that we only articulate the meaning of things on the basis of already existing in some sense. Well, in a way, there's a parallelism here between uh, Sartre's version of phenomenology and Heidegger's version of phenomenology. So because the, the nuclear realization for Heidegger has to do with Dasein, well, any attempt to understand things at the ontological level is always going to be bound up to all of the particularities at the ontic level, all right? That we try to say things and, uh, about being, and we write books perhaps like uh, being in time from the point of view of already being in the world. You get it? So uh, because of that, um, any insights we have are going to be, they're bound to be shaped and influenced by all the particulars of our world embeddedness, such as, well, I gave you a list, like cultural particulars, linguistic particulars, you know, the business of separation of subjects and objects, historical particulars, political, economic, personal history and personal situation, like all of that inescapably enters into uh, our attempt to do a hermeneutic come to a hermeneutic type understanding of the meaning of being, all right? So texts like uh, being in time are not going to be aspiring to uh, be something like, um, you know, monolithic 
unquestionable, unassailable articulations of the meaning of existence for all time. And the reason why is precisely because of Dasein. Right? Because that's what we are. We write books from the perspective of an ever-shifting, ever-changing um, world embeddedness because we are instances of Dasein. Okay. So uh, hopefully that is making his project cohere a little bit differently. Now, the other element of what I wanted to do in this video by way of setting up his project is uh, the other thing that we have not talked about with regard to hermeneutics earlier in uh, the semester is uh, th this question. Well, you know, okay, so if you're going to do this hermeneutic phenomenological rendering of the meaning of being, how is it that you're, you can be convinced that the insights you come to are not just a really tricky way of rearranging your already existing biases and uh, investments and agendas that are part and parcel of your world embeddedness in the first place. How can you be reasonably convinced that you're coming to any kind of new insight on the basis of being in the world? Maybe all you're doing is doing an intellectualized rearrangement of the furniture in the room, but that you haven't really discovered anything new at all. Okay, so uh, for that reason, Part of doing a hermeneutic of something, and actually um, Heidegger's student and protege Gadamer articulated this in much greater detail than Heidegger did, although it is mentioned in Being in Time. Uh, part of what you want to do is try to recognize the four structures of your interpretive activity as best you can, to own how you're coming to see the phenomenon in question. All right? So uh, to articulate uh, you know, your investments and your desires to see things in a certain kind of way and perhaps your power investments, who knows, to make some effort to try to name that and own that so that when people look at your phenomenological rendering, let's say of being, they can judge for themselves the extent to which you may be unduly biased or that you're slipping into a, a kind of a weird circularity where you're own already existing ad agenda is merely getting a confirmation within the circularity of the hermeneutic project. Okay, so recognizing the four structures of your understanding is part of doing a hermeneutic on something. All right, so uh, I articulated that in terms of seeking out a kind of middle way, as it were, uh, within uh, phenomenological hermeneutic type inquiry. So let me see how I said it to you in your notes. On one hand, Heidegger wants to inquire into a being, into being in a way that actually reveals something new about it. Okay, what's the point of writing the damn book if you never reveal something new about it? On the other hand, he wants to acknowledge that whatever is revealed is subject to, but not completely bound by, various biases which are part and parcel of our world embeddedness and an inevitable consequence of being in the world. At first, this may sound like an impossible balance, but actually isn't any kind of understanding a product of exactly those kinds of tensions. The tension between wanting to see the world in a particular way, between already predisposed to seeing the world in a particular way, and on the other hand, the hopeful emergence of some new insight, some genuinely new insight that is not merely the product of your already existing biases. All right, so that brings us up to Aletheia. Okay, which you've heard about before. So uh, let's see. Let's maybe do one little segment on Aletheia and see if we can uh, end the video at that at the end of that. Okay. So the first thing you need to do is remember this is not new stuff. When we were talking about the Rollo May book, he brought up the idea of Aletheia, and this is Heidegger's. Uh, he actually takes it from the Greeks. To be honest, Aletheia is a like a, an uncovering. Ah. Uh, Alpha in Greek mean, is a grammatical privative, which means it negates the thing that follows it. And Lathia is referring to a uh, covering over or a veiling. So in essence, a Lathia is a kind of uncovering or a kind of discovering, discovering. And I'm trying to say that word in a way where you can sort of hear that this idea of a Lathia is in a way embedded into it. So uh, for Heidegger, this is another relatively early realization within his phenomenological inquiry that the truth of being or the truth of existence is about a kind of uncovering or a kind of discovering, 
discovering. Um, and uh, the trick uh, behind this, there's two tricks really. First of all, that this idea of truth is going to be very different from the adequation theory of truth. Okay, so what's the adequation theory of truth? Well, that's an idea that comes to us by way of medieval scholasticism. So the philosophical tradition of the medieval period in the form of medieval scholasticism, which would hold that uh, something is true when what we say matches. Okay, so the camera shut off automatically, once again reminding me to uh, make an ending out of this video because it's already getting too long. So we were talking about the adequation theory of truth from the tradition of medieval scholasticism. And basically the adequation theory is probably the truth theory that most of us intuitively buy into. Like when we think of, well, what's the nature of truth in an intuitive way? Probably most of us say like, well, the truth is, happens if what you say matches reality that you can observe. Okay, so adequation means basically that, that the two correspond, that the articulation matches the reality. And for Heidegger, well, you know, that sort of idea of truth can only happen upon the basis of something more fundamental. And the something more fundamental is going to be the dynamics of revealing and the dynamics of revealing, in turn, are about a kind of uncovering. So the first trick behind Aletheia is to know that it's a more fundamental or radical way of inquiring into the nature of truth than the adequation theory, which most of us probably just take for granted. So uh, the second trick, which is definitely um, uh, less, <laughs> less intuitive, is that actually what discovering is about is not merely sort of pulling uh, the blanket off of something and seeing what's underneath it. Uh, the idea here is that uh, uncovering something can only happen on the basis of concealing something. All right, so really what's, what's going on in a more fundamental way than whether what you say matches the observable reality is, are the dynamics of concealment and unconcealment, which sounds like an odd word in English, but that's actually one of the uh, translations used in Being in Time with regard to this Aletheia issue. In other words, and I'm going to try to make it sound even more um, astonishing perhaps, that, that every act of revealing is also an act of concealing, that every truth conceals something. All right. So every one of the functions of truth is to conceal things, that every revealing is also a concealing. And at first this seems like maybe sort of an outlandish, wild idea, but it's not that outlandish and wild when you actually think about it. It's like, um, you know, the news works this way. Like you start watching uh, the nightly news or, uh, well, uh, probably not that many people watch the news anymore. You start sort of streaming the news into your cyber chip brain implant. Let's use 21st century language. And, uh, you know, they try to convince you that certain things are true. And I think it's, it's a fairly obvious thing in the 21st century that every attempt to try to convince you that something is true deflects your attention away from something else that you might be able to perceive. And the news does this all the time, right? So I think in the 21st century, we've become very sensitive and acclimated to that, that even if what they're saying is true, according to the rules of the adequation theory, the other effect of telling you a certain kind of truth is that it deflects your attention and your perceptual field away from something else that you might perceive, that one of the functions of the truth is to conceal certain things. At a more personal level, let's give you another example, because I know this can be sort of a weird idea when you hear it at first. It's like, you know, the truth of your perceptual field, like just sort of crude perceptual truths work the, cert the same way. So as I'm looking at the camera here, <laughs> I'm speaking to the camera, which is itself an odd kind of thing, but uh, I'm, so I'm looking at the camera and I'm looking at my own image as I'm saying this and pointing, um, on the little screen on the side of the camera. And as I'm looking at that, the stuff behind me, like that red chair over there, is not within my visual field. You know, so you look in one particular direction, you turn your head, 
and all of a sudden the stuff over there is something you can't see. You turn your head in another way and all of a sudden there's stuff over there that you can't see. The same thing is true with respect to how your thought processes work. Okay, so the truth of your thought processes works the same way. So if you're, if you're uh, thinking of um, what, like the capital of Mongolia, Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia, like you're thinking of uh, you know, people perhaps who live there or where it is geographically, and all of a sudden you're not thinking of other countries, like uh, let's say um, uh, Mexico, all right, so Mexico City or somewhere like that. You know, so now I'm thinking of Mexico City, but now all of a sudden I'm not thinking of uh, wherever, like <laughs> um, Cambodia, Cambodia. So uh, Phnom Penh, Cambodia. So uh, now all of a sudden I'm not thinking of uh, um, Canada and so on. Are you getting the idea? Like you think of a certain one or two things and everything else is sort of thrown into darkness. You look at one particular thing and all of a sudden everything in a way is thrown into a kind of darkness. So this idea that one of the functions of truth is to conceal things is not so far-fetched and wild as it might seem at first. But for Heidegger, this is a very important idea because uh, ultimately the truth of existence, the kind of truth he's trying to get at by way of his phenomenological project is exactly along that terrain of revealing and concealing. Okay, simultaneous revealing and concealing. And he has uh, several ways of talking about that, like the clearing, like a clearing in a forest kind of. He's looking for a kind of clearing in a forest, knowing all well, all fully well that you know other things are going to be hidden in the trees of that forest, and that's an apt metaphor because a lot of this, you know, Heidegger is very famously associated with the Black Forest and doing a lot of his work in the Black Forest of Germany. Another way he has of talking about this Aletheia idea is lighting up. So lighting up, let's let's take a look at that. It's like, have you ever uh, been in a dark basement? Like, let's say the lights in your ho house go out, and so you have to light up a flashlight. Well, that would be sort of an, a great example of Aletheia, too. So you point the flashlight in one direction, let's say in your basement, like you're looking for the fuse box, right? A fuse box. I'm such a damn dinosaur. The breaker box uh, in your basement, and you, you shine the thing over here, and you see the hot water heater, but when you see the hot water heater, because you don't want to run into it, everything else is thrown into darkness. So you shift the light over here, and you see whatever, the air conditioner unit, and everything else is thrown into darkness. Then you shift the light over here, and you see the breaker box, and everything else is thrown into darkness. Actually, all of our truths at some level work that way. And with that, we're, that sets us up for what I want to do in the next video, which is to begin to really start going into some of these phenomenological insights. Once again, the point of this video is just to set up Heidegger's project. Notice a few things that you've already heard about earlier in the semester so that when we start digging into some of these insights, they're going to be much more comprehensible to you and much more directly revealed, even if that revealing also conceals something. So that's enough for this video. Have a great day. Take care.